Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to give a quick overview of the Intelligent Game Console from Mattel Electronics. This was test marketed in 1979 and released in 1980 for approximately $300. It did include a packing title, an odd choice though, Las Vegas Poker and Blackjack. Not something that would appeal to kids, so at that price range perhaps they were aiming at the adult crowd, but they did replace this game later as a pack and they uh, chose Astro Smash, which is possibly the most popular game on the system. So the system doesn't have too many buttons, reset button, on off switch, cartridge slot in the side, and the base just has a channel selector, which is pretty common on older electronics, especially VCRs, you just select channel four or three, and that's what channel the TV needs to be set on to play. Now, this is a pretty powerful console for the time. The graphics are, are uh, quite better than the Atari 2600, which was the main competition when this released. And what makes it really unique is the controller. Whereas Atari primarily had one, a joystick and what with one button, they also had some paddle controllers. This um, has a keypad with 12, 12 keys and then side buttons. There's two on each side though, they typically do the same thing so that you could hold the controller with either hand, however you want to do it. And then the disc, which controls your on-screen character object. So it's a lot to actually manage for some games, is you do have, some games use these buttons quite a bit, some don't. Some simply use it for number of player selection or difficulty level. But what makes it easier is you can put overlays on top of the buttons. So they slide in, most games come with these. And once it's in place, you can see, you know what you need to do for each button. So if you hit button one, you'll select the left fielder, nine, first baseman. And it even labels the side buttons. The top button is bat, the bottom is bunt, and then it points down here what the game disc does. So can pitch or move a player, and that's how most of the overlays work. And like I said, most games came with them, a few didn't, mostly the later games, some of them don't, but a lot of those only use really the side buttons, they're more basic. Now this is what all the Mattel's cartridges look like. Each company that published games for the platform made their own little plastic case for the cartridge, so they're all a bit different. This one here is a re-release of the first baseball game. So it just slides in like that and they are they have some grooves here to help you get it out because they can be a little tight when you pull them out. I was saying so this is a re-release. This is big league baseball which is the same as major league baseball but with this game and a few others they had a license when they first released the game so this one had the MLB license and there's an Advanced Dungeons and Dragons license, even Chess and Backgammon had some kind of association licenses. The game Skiing was originally called US Ski Team Skiing. So you get the idea, They uh, the license would run out so they'd re-release the game. Either have to change the title or just remove the beginning of the title. Like with Skiing, it just became Skiing, they dropped the US Ski Team portion. Same thing with Word Fun and Math Fun, those were endorsed by the Electric Company, which was a, not a utility company, that was a kid's show, educational show back in the 80s. So these later boxes also are not as good as the originals, they are uh, pretty basic cardboard box with a top flap, whereas the original games have this nice flap. And then you get the manual overlays and they all came with uh, catalogs as well. And then the cartridge on the other side. Something else they did was color code the boxes. So Astro Smash in a dark blue box is considered a space network game. They put the word network after each one. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this. It focuses down here, so try to angle it here. It says space network in baseball. We'll say Sports Network, it's a lighter blue for all the sports games. And then the two best, well, my favorite games on the system, Utopia and Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Purple represents strategy, red action. Something I want to show about Dungeons and Dragons, because I will play this in the future, 
and I'll, I'll probably struggle a little bit sometimes because although it's a great game the controls are probably the most challenging controls of any game on this system because we can see here are the side buttons run while the disc moves and the keypad is how you fire your arrows so if you hold the controller like this you want to press the side button to run while you're moving but you're also going to want to shoot the enemies that are chasing you while you're moving so and you can stop running and shoot or you can try to use you know your index finger on this hand <laughs> it's tricky you also have to be careful of walls because arrows ricochet off of walls and you can end up shooting it yourself so it's a really cool game but it's not easy that's for sure another type of game until released we're in the black box these used keyboard controllers now you can use the gamepad but it's the games are basic when you do that it's meant to teach so this is software that's meant to teach basic programming so if you had the keyboard you'd um probably need to use the manual then you'd look up like commands you need to type to actually trigger your actions uh, there was a keyboard in 1982 they kind of rushed that there's a history to look up online because i can't give you the whole thing right now but they had a run-in with the federal trade commission and then in 1983 they replaced that keyboard with a better whole unit called the ECS which was the entertainment computer system which came with a keyboard music synthesizer we added some extra memory extra ROM so it made it a little more advanced but I don't have any of those keyboards to show you now for third-party games I'll show you some different cartridge types so this one here is from Activision you likely know if they're still around they make the call of duty games now this is one of the better designed cartridges i think it curves in where the grooves are so you can grip it and your hand doesn't really slide as much so that's a nice cartridge this one probably the most unique cartridge is from a company called interphase they put a hole right here in the plastic so it's a bit different i guess you could kind of pull it that way or get even hang it on something just never seen another cartridge like that uh, Clico, who later made their own system, the Clico Vision, did make games for the Intellivision as well. This is a port of Nintendo's Donkey Kong. Not a good one. It's maybe considered the worst version of Donkey Kong, perhaps. Just not well well made, and the, the, the disc doesn't help at all. This disc, although very interesting, <laughs> it doesn't always work great for every type of game, and Donkey Kong is really the type of game it's not so great with. Now these cartridges, basic rectangle, a little longer than uh, Mattel's, but, but still pretty standard. Now this one says not for use with Intellivision 2, which was the second model of Intellivision, obviously called the 2, that Mattel made. Now the Intellivision 2, I have played it, I don't own it, but it's about maybe this size, it is smaller. It's made of white plastic, this one's much heavier duty. And it had controllers that detached. You may have noticed these do not detach. They have a somewhat short cord. Although the Intellivision 2 cords are just as short. The only reason they detach them, I guess, would be if they broke, maybe you could acquire a new one. These you'd have to take apart to get them off of the system. So the Intellivision 2, other than size difference, it also the keypad was flat buttons. I like these buttons much better. They pop up and you can feel them. All right, back to some uh, third-party games. Atlantis was from a Magic. Now Magic is a company, one of the earliest third-party publishers. That was formed by um, former Atari and Mattel employees. And they used the uh, silver foil on the cartridges on the game box, likely make it stand out at retail. They just have a sliding tray box. All these boxes are kind of flimsy. You can't put too much weight on them, but Parker Brothers is a much sturdier box. You really can't damage these as easily. This course is Frogger, another well well known uh, arcade game like Donkey Kong. These cartridges are a bit long too, a lot longer than uh, Mattel's. They have the same angle in the front. And you'll notice on this one it says for Intellivision, Candyvision, and Sears Super Video Arcade. 
So, those are three different consoles, but they're all made, at least with Mattel support. Tandy Vision, also called Tandy Vision 1, is from Radio Shack. And of course, Super Video Arcade is from Sears. So, at their stores, they sold their own version of the Intellivision, and they play all, all the games, same games. So Radio Shack and Sears, although probably today you'd think all oh, those are insignificant retailers, but back in the early 80s, they were much bigger, especially Sears. It was always a big company for a long time. They have catalog orders, and it was good to have your system in their stores, and if it took making a separate console, it was worth it. Now Sears also did something a little different in that they boxed games separately from Mattel, even though they are the same games. So all of them are this color box. They have their own artwork and the manual cover varies a bit. But otherwise the overlays and cartridge are identical to Mattel's. In fact, Mattel, you know, made them. They just put them in their own packaging. So that's what you'd buy at it. Sears if you bought the television games there. Other, you know, competitors actually made games for each other's platform, which is kind of odd, but you could buy games from Mattel on the Atari systems under the M Network label. That was what they used to uh, publish. And then Atari published games on Intellivision under the Atari Soft name. So, not something you really see today, but back then, I guess it was worth it to make a few extra bucks, put your games on the other the competition system. Now, I also have an add on module. This is the Intellivoice. A voice synthesis module. This is a volume dial. So this would plug into the cartridge slot like, like so. And then cartridges would go in here, but they have to be specifically made for it. So there are only four games made for this IntelliVoice, and then there's a fifth game that can take advantage of it. But that's not very many games. What it did was add more advanced speech. So Intellivision could make speech. You don't. I don't know if it's in too many games other than like baseball could. I think it said you're out, if I recall, or something along those lines. But with this, the computer is much clearer and can speak full sentences. And they did have ideas to make this multi-language, but that never happened, so it's just in English. Now this, along with some of these games I'm mentioning, I acquired within the last 10 years. I didn't have all of these when I was a kid. This device cost $70. It was released in 1982. They made, like I said, the keyboards and then they had also had an add-on module that could play actual Atari games on the Intellivision. Not something that I think would be allowed today. I don't know how they got away with it then, but they made a number of add-on devices. Always have to plug into the cartridge slot because that's all there was. Another item, and I don't have the actual item because you have to return it, tied into this play cable now play cable my family did have this ran from 1981 to 1983 we got our console in 1981 we signed up for this play cable service and what it is is it's a online game service basically I mean you call it online there was no internet then but you went through the cable network to access games this is what came in 1981 but if you had the Sega Genesis and were in the correct market in the early 90s, you could get the Sega Channel, which is very, very similar to this. Now, I never played it. I just read about it because I didn't live in a market that had it. But I did live in Shelton, Connecticut, where Play Cable was available. So we got it. And what it is is, like, each month you get 15 games to choose from. Now, you can't select what library is available, but as new games came out, they would put new games on the on the service so you'd get to try them and then at the time they'd have to remove other games so you know the selection would vary sometimes a game would be removed but come back a few months later they just swap them in and out give you a good selection now, this is the pamphlet advertising the play cable service I'll have a scan of this on my blog and I'll leave a link in the video description so you can read it much better and this is just a bunch of games and there's a picture here of the module it looks a lot like the console just extends out of the cartridge slot. Like I said, you had to return these when you ended your subscription or when it ended in 1983, so we gave ours back. I don't know if maybe some people were able to keep it. 
so we actually moved before the service ended at that point because you don't have any cartridges because you don't need them that's when I had to start buying cartridges but 1983 was also when the video game crash occurred so I was able to acquire a lot of games for just a few bucks I even remember shopping I mean, I was only eight so my parents were the ones buying the games but pretty sure there were games as low as a dollar there was a store I think it was called Odd Lots in Connecticut it had just stacks of games just in you know in bins that you could just buy for really cheap nobody wanted them at that point so exciting time to be alive I guess if you like games I would have probably bought a lot more if I was older now this is the box they gave you when you subscribed it was to hold your manuals and your overlays which is really nice now you get them for every game that was on the service because of course you would need the overlays and I own a lot of manuals here that I don't own games necessarily for at this point but get to keep the manuals and overlays from the subscription service so I've got them here for games I have played but just don't currently have because I didn't buy them after the uh, subscription ended and a lot of extra overlays here it's a nice little box to hold everything now unfortunately with the video game crash it's probably played a uh, big part in it Mattel decided to sell the Intellivision so they Closed down Mattel Electronics in 1984 and sold all the assets to investors known as the INTV Corporation. And they continued to sell the Intellivision 2s, which were still in stock. And then they manufactured their own third model of the Intellivision. I used to own that. I do not currently have it. I let my neighbor borrow it when we were younger, so I never got it back. But the reason we, I bought that one. That one was $70 and released in 1986. One of my game pads had stopped working. Probably this one, because you can tell. I wore it out pretty good. I played this quite a bit. This was my first console. So my neighbor and I, we got the other one. Now, it's very similar to this one. It has, this, has silver here instead of the bronze look. You know, it has a power light. But the keypads are flat, like the Intelligent 2, and I didn't really like those, so my neighbor and I opened up the controller, we were able to swap a part, and then it made the keypad work again. So then the new one only had one working gamepad, but I wanted to use this, this system instead, so I let him take that one. And INTV kept going for a little while, but they did have to compete with Shelf Space, because although there was the video game crash in 83, 1985, video games started to rise again with the NES. Nintendo was able to get that into toy stores and then year after that Sega arrived. Sega wasn't as popular in North America but still it's another product competing for shelf space so eventually Intellivision got kicked out of retailers basically phased out and it became something you could only get through mail order for through catalogs and then in 1990 INTV declared bankruptcy and closed down in 1991. But in that 10 year span of 1979 to 1989, 125 games were released, and a 10 year lifespan is pretty good for a game console. Alright, sorry for the abrupt edit. Had to cut out some background noise, and I'm filming this on a different day, so the lighting will be a little different as well. I just wanted to mention before I end it, there are some compilations available. They're all a bit old at this point, though. There was Intellivision Rocks on PC, and this one's a little newer Intellivision Lives. Appears on PlayStation 2, Xbox, GameCube, Nintendo DS, PC, and Mac. It's also available digitally on PlayStation 3, and the Xbox version should work on Xbox 360, but again, generation behind, so not too new. Plus, the gamepad of the Intellivision doesn't always translate well to a modern gamepad, so there's a trade off, but it's an option to play some of the games, try them out. I also wanted to mention this guy here who's on the box and on this pin I have that's the running man often the logo of the Intellivision it's the animated human character you'll see in a number of games when I play and I wanted to mention IntellivisionLives.com this is also called Intellivision Lives but it's also the website that former Mattel programmers run that has the complete history of the system I use it as reference and I recommend you read it and there's tons of information there and it's great if you like classic games so intelligentlives.com I'll leave a link 
in the video description to that and to my blog entry. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.